Welcome everyone. Cannabis News. I'm your host Joe Claire. It's January 2nd, 2019. The show is presented as always by the Marijuana Times, marijuanatimes.org. Check us out on there. Today we're talking about uh, the hysterics over the coming of corporate cannabis. Ah, corporations. Also, the new incoming House Rules Chairman and House Representatives seeing a different tune when it comes to marijuana legalization than his predecessor. Also, some initial sales totals from legalization in Canada. All that's coming up at first. Of course, Cannabis News is brought to you by NatureSide, nature-side.com, and their organic, all-natural pesticides. Grow safe and poison-free. Don't use harmful chemicals on what you are growing People have to ingest those things, whether you're growing cannabis, you're growing something else. Make sure you use organic, all-natural pesticides. If you are growing cannabis, of course, you don't want to use banned pesticides. You want to be regulatory compliant. In the state that you are growing in, you can do all of these things, of course, with NatureSide, nature-side.com. Side is spelled C-I-D-E, a proud sponsor of Cannabis News. Thank you to them. This first story by yours truly, over marijuanatimes.org. The hysterics over the evil coming of corporate cannabis. This is a subject that I've talked about before in print and here on the show. People are worried about big corporations coming in and dominating the cannabis industry. We'll make a few points in this article. Uh, the first one is that corporations are not inherently evil, and corporations have not been shown historically to have been a detriment to the societies they function in. A perfect example is the society that we enjoy right now. Many of the services, commodities, products, whatever you want to call it, that make your life better today come from a corporation that is one of the dominating corporations in whatever industry that they are in. People are worried to say, you know, maybe three big companies will come to dominate uh, most of cannabis. But but like I point out in the article, what really matters is choice. If there's only those three, then yeah, that could, you know, somehow become a problem. You know, the restriction of competition, the restriction of uh, of, of, of choice for consumers is invariably a bad thing. But say you have three cannabis companies that dominate, you know, 60% of the market, but then you have 30 cannabis companies that take the other 40%. That's 33 choices for cannabis consumers. There's no reason... If there's a if the if the market and the industry is wide open enough that a lot of people can get into it, that there can't be you don't have to dominate an industry to be profitable in it. You don't have to dominate it to create jobs. You don't have to dominate it to be a force in whatever community that you're in. You know, retail sales, fast food sales. These are perfect examples. These are comparable to what marijuana sales are going to be, and cannabis sales. Retail sales are going to be the backbone of the industry, obviously, because if you don't sell anything, nobody's going to make any money and nobody's going to be interested in going into the business in the first place, which means that the industry won't exist. So you have a lot of companies, you know, uh, McDonald's, uh, I guess they're still number one when it comes to fast food. They dominate, but there's still a ton of choices under that. Companies are not as big as McDonald's. Maybe they're not nationwide. Maybe they're a regional company. Uh, but oftentimes those companies are are great. They're more receptive with customer service. They're more family atmosphere. Uh, they're more receptive to uh, an adaptive to changes in the market. Whatever. Maybe they're hungrier. If it, to use a cliched phrase, as long as there's choice for consumers, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter who dominates the market. McDonald's may dominate the market, but I don't have to go to McDonald's. I have thirty other choices. I need food brought to me. I can cook my own food, which is also comparable to cannabis. Now, when it comes to cannabis, the problem is this. High taxes, strict regulations, high licensing fees, this sets the bar very high for people getting in. So that will become a problem. If only the very top companies can survive, that limits choice. If you lower regulations, you lower licensing fees especially, you lower taxes, you allow as many people as possible to get into this industry and get a foothold in this industry. Whether they succeed or fail, let them have a chance to get off the ground, provide the most, the maximum amount of choice for consumers, and the market will work. Now, maybe there, you know, there'll be adjustments that will come and they'll go, and there'll be companies that leave. And one of the big, the big three or the big four, they'll they'll form, and one will fall by the wayside and it'll be replaced. 
like I pointed out in the article, you know, 100 years ago, Sears was a huge retailer. Now people don't go to Sears. Before Walmart and Target and all that even existed. Sears was the big thing. Take a trip to Sears. Go buy some stuff. Uh, A&P groceries. You know, those things don't, people don't go to these things anymore. Because they've been replaced by other things. That's how the market will evolve. You know, some will come to the top, some will fall, some will rise a little bit and fall. Some will rise a little bit and stay there. It doesn't matter. As long as there's a maximum amount of choice for consumers, a lot of different companies can succeed and create jobs and be a force in their community and and make the lives of the people that use their services or buy stuff from them better. And corporations can do that. Corporations do do that. This is all the stuff you see looking at me. The, the broadcasting software, the computers, the keyboard, uh, this microphone, uh, this uh, this mixer, the the modem, they're all made by big corporations. And I could, the, that list goes on from, you know, uh, the, 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 the car you call to come pick you up to the groceries you buy to the, the stuff you buy at Walmart, all that stuff. It's not something to fear because corporations invariably have more advantages over smaller companies. They can make, they can produce products that are cheaper and of better quality because of economies of scale and things like that. They take advantage of their size to be able to, to do things better. And as I said yesterday, I'm looking for the best quality price uh, product that's the lowest price. That's what I'm looking for. That's what most consumers are looking for. Everybody's going to make decisions that are best for them, whether it's some guy on the street or it's a CEO. They're going to make the decisions that are best for themselves and their families and the people they care about. It doesn't change no matter where on society's ladder, what rung you're on. It's a constant of, uh, of, of humankind. But corporations, and look, I know, we all want... Oh, by the way, home growing. That's another key component. Not only does the industry need to be wide open, but home growing. Like that, the example I used before, you cook your own food at home. You can grow your own, your own weed at home. You don't have to worry about it at all if you don't want to even participate and give money to those corporations. Don't. I don't care. I don't care if you don't go buy from Walmart. I don't care if you drive a little while longer or pay a little bit more somewhere else or you, or you go online on Amazon or, you know, um, a big drone shaped like an elephant drops out of the sky through your front window. I don't care. It's none of my business. Maximum choice. That is the key. No matter who the choices are. If there's a bunch of them, it doesn't matter who the choices are. Anyway, that is my spiel. Don't feel cor fear of corporations. I know, like I said, we don't want to be buy our way from a farmer's market or from a commune or, you know, gifted and, you know, a super cool Rasta ceremony. Yeah, you can do all that. But you don't have to worry about corporations. And if you are worried about the corporation, don't buy from them. Just don't buy from them. Buy from the mom and pop. Buy from the craft cannabis grower. Buy from uh, the, the little shop on the other block. Whatever. Choice. That's what matters is choice. As long as there's choice, everything else is fine. It's next story, MarijuanaMoment.net. Incoming House Rules Chair signs on to far-reaching marijuana reform bill. Of course, many of you will remember from uh, your perusal of cannabis news and, of course, from watching the show as well. Pete Sessions is the uh, former. Well, I guess he's still got a day or two left. I don't know how, uh, when they officially end. But he's the outgoing House of Representatives Rules Committee chairman. He lost his congressional seats. Not only did he lose his chairmanship, when the Democrats took the House, he lost his seat completely when he lost his election. <laughs> so, But he was the roadblock to all of the marijuana law reform bills getting to the floor of the House of Representatives. So he's gone. There's a new sheriff in town, as they say. Representative Jim McGovern, he's a Democrat from Massachusetts. He's the incoming chairman of the powerful committee. He stands in stark contrast to his predecessor's adamant opposition to cannabis law reform legislation. Uh, McGovern has already gone on the record committing to allow cannabis measures to reach the House floor, saying, quote, he's not going to block marijuana amendments like my predecessor has done, and now he has added his name to a bill that would federally deschedule marijuana and punish states with discriminatory cannabis enforcement. Of course, the, um, the Marijuana Justice Act, he's now a co-sponsor. So we go from Pete Sessions, who blocked every marijuana bill that he saw, to Jim McGovern, who's the new chairman of the House Rules Committee, he says he's not, only, he's not only not going to block them, now he's on record as being a full 
full-fledged supporter of uh, the end of marijuana prohibition. And, uh, well, I mean, that can only be a good thing. I mean, <laughs> where, where there was a huge dam in the river before, now there's like, you know, a, not, only, not only is the dam gone and the water's flowing, there's a guy there with like a paddle and he's trying to push it farther. It's not the best analogy, but you get what I'm talking about. He's paddling to make the water move down the river faster <laughs> with his paddle. <laughs> this is not... It's not the greatest analogy. They're not all gold. What can I say? Sometimes you take what you get. The point was made. That's the important thing when it comes to analogies. If the point is made, then you've done your job. This is what I tell myself. This last story is from star.com. Cannabis store sales total $43 million in the first two weeks after legalization in Canada. Statistics Canada says, a sale, says sales at cannabis stores in the two weeks after legalization totaled $43 a million dollars. The agency started collecting data for in-store and online sales from cannabis retailers as of October 17th. Those things became illegal for recreational adult use purposes in Canada. When fresh or dried bud, oiled plants, and seeds became legal for recreational use in the country. Uh, the first set of data released as part of the agency's broader monthly retail trade figures only encompass two weeks, but will reflect a complete reference month in the future. Statistics Canada says different retail structures in each province and territory affected cannabis availability across the country. Of course, there's been shortages in many places in Canada, uh, so much so that it was actually addressed by Prime Minister Trudeau, who said that the, um, it's been the biggest challenge so far, but they expect the supply problems to be alleviated within a year. Uh, edibles are not yet allowed legally in Canada, but Health Canada released draft regulations for the sale of edibles uh, they'll become legal no later than October 17th of 2019. So the one-year anniversary of legalization in Canada could see the legalization of edibles in Canada, which is good because, you know, edibles serve a, a big purpose, obviously, uh, especially for recreational users and medical users. Uh, packages of edibles, uh, according to new regulations, draft regulations, which there's public input in the draft regulations for the edibles, until February 20th, uh, it would restrict the regulations would restrict the sale of cannabis-infused booze and uh, packaging or labeling of beer or wine products together with cannabis. It would also limit packages of edibles to be no more than 10 milligrams of THC. Uh, the regulations propose restrictions on ingredients that could make the products more appealing to children. You know, the drill. So if you're in Canada and you want to comment on uh, the edibles regulations... Well, you have until February 20th to do so. Thanks, everybody, for checking out the show. Keep sharing, liking, commenting. Obviously, check us out at MarijuanaTimes.org. Thank you to NatureSide, nature-side.com, and their organic, all-natural pesticides. Thank you for spreading the truth about cannabis with this show, and we'll see you next time right here on Cannabis News. (laughs) 